very excited to say that we have, uh, obviously we have one alum on the trip, and we have a second alum uh, with us right now, very cool. So uh, Vanessa, um, uh, I don't know how long I've known Vanessa, like 15 years, something like that, something like that, 15 years. So I first, we first, uh, John and I first met Vanessa when we were coming here, actually, so her dad and I did a, a thing at Oxford many years ago. Um, uh, and, uh, and I met him and her dad is a great dude. Uh, Oxford, uh, you'll find this surprising. Oxford is a very staid place. So, uh, uh, I can tell you other stories, but, uh, the, the story that's worth, that's, that's okay to share on video is that, um, we were doing this thing, presenting all these different scientific results about stuff in this big famous old, uh, uh presentation place. Her dad was talking about Hurricane Katrina. Um, her dad is Ivor Van Heerden, if you guys remember uh, some of those stories. Um, the, he wrote a book about Katrina. Yeah, but sort of uh, speaking truth to power. We can talk about that after, but we were talking about Vanessa now. But anyway, so I met him, and then it's a science, you know, several days in Oxford, which sounds super cool, right? Old center of learning, one of the oldest universities in the world, and all that kind of great stuff. And so we're like, great, let's go out and do stuff at night. Oh my God, the most boring town on the planet. I've never been to a more boring town. So we'd go out and several times her father and I got kicked out of pubs by people saying, you blokes are too loud and you're swearing. And the first time it happened, like, that was weird. Wait, and then, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Vanessa, is your dad very loud? Not at all. Not, not even <laughs> Extremely loud. Really, is he loud? Wow. Especially after. So, anyway, I just so say we became fast shot. friends. I mean, we became fast friends. Nobody else was hanging out with us. We were the ones that were hanging out. So anyway, so, so then afterwards, I said, wow, we bring students to, to New Orleans. We should visit with you. And so for many years, when her dad was still in Louisiana, would come and speak to our class so very generously. And one of those trips, we met Vanessa. And then uh, after the Deep Water Horizon, I believe is what it was, we did a symposium on campus. So we invited various folks, including her dad, uh, to come and, and speak and talk to us about what was going on with the Gulf Coast, uh, sustainability, oil spills, uh, hurricanes, all that kind of stuff. And so we came and Vanessa came, and she's like, well, this is an interesting campus. And so then we foolishly tricked her to come be a student at our campus. So then she came. Uh, uh, so it was awesome. So Vanessa uh, totally knows our program. She's been where all you, you all have been. Um, uh, she was uh, our first writing tutor so we got some money to uh, help students with writing in 100 and other things. She was that. She was a, a TA for GIS. She did all kinds of stuff. In addition to you know our experience here, she also came with us on our tr on our um, uh, uh, trip, which John was also came along with us. He was a co-instructor to the Cook Islands. So she did her capstone on essentially data from the equivalent of this trip, but that was in the South Pacific, looking at reef health and visualizing stuff. So she did that looking at. Uh, like how healthy are the reefs and let's have some cool visualizations geospatially showing that in a static environment and she really liked it and then she got married and then uh, they the lovely couple came back to Baton Rouge came back to wait are you so you maybe I didn't too far okay. no, no, so so <laughs> so they came back she gets into a PhD program at LSU, and uh, I'll say it because uh, she's not talking, is like super, super awesome kick butt, not no surprise. And it sort of has become indispensable, I would argue, to several different efforts on campus because even though we think that all of we, we professors are great with statistics, are great with GIS, are great with whatever, not all of us are. And so uh, she became someone that kind of could uh, help people out in different contexts and different settings. And I think. I don't want to speak, but I think that's sort of what also helped focus some of the PhD stuff. So, uh, so with that, uh, almost, not, this is the last time I'll probably introduce her is not Dr. Van Heer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah, so I'm Vanessa. Uh, I graduated from CI in 2017, and I got an ESRM degree and a biology degree. Um, the ESRM degree was much more beneficial, so good job for picking that one. Let's see, I, he's right, I got married um, and then decided to come back to Louisiana. My parents are uh, here, my husband's whole family is here, so we decided to come back and save some money. And then I got a job at uh, the dean's office in the college that I'm currently at doing an actual uh, interactive story map for the entire college, which is basically, I've interviewed every
every single faculty member and every single graduate student and I map where their research is so that we can show how our that college's international research is uh, impacting the world. So from that, uh, I wasn't planning on getting my PhD at LSU, but I was interviewing one of the faculty members and within 30 minutes of our conversation, he agreed to be my PhD advisor and was like, let's do it. Um, and so then I decided to get my PhD at LSU. And from that, uh, I've done a lot of things. So are any of you planning to go to graduate school? Maybe. I know it's kind of hard to think about. Maybe. Yeah, graduate school. Okay. Um, so the interesting thing about graduate school is that you should get paid to go to graduate school. <laughs> you should not pay anything. So typically what you do is half your time, you do your research, the other half of your time, you're paid to do something else. And there are three ways. So one, you can be a teaching assistant, which is that you help faculty with their classes. Two, you can be an RA, which is a research assistant, which is basically you help your advisor do research, typically that's grant funded. And then the other way is to find another type of job on campus. Um, I was wonky, and I'm gonna suggest that you don't be wonky unless you have a different career path than what normal people want. Um, and that I came in and started to started my PhD with a project that was not funded. So I came in, told my advisor, this is what I wanted to do. He was like, cool, I don't have any funding for that. I was like, that's fine, I'm gonna find my own. So I was a teaching assistant for our department. Um, I was a science communicator for our department. Um, I helped bring a uh, fundraise for our college. So I had to talk to donors that were had millions and millions of dollars and I had to get them to give it to us. Um, I was an instructor of record, so that's basically like the same thing as a lecturer at CI. And then now I run, uh, now I run a program. It's a, it's called Environmentor. It is a weekly after school high school um, science research program. And what we do is that every week after school, we bring uh, 15 underrepresented students from uh, high schools around camp around LSU to LSU. Um, they get partnered up with an undergraduate and a graduate student who mentors them on a science project of whatever they're interested in. So right now we have done projects looking at diatoms, potential use in biofuel production. Uh, we have a project going right now that's about uh, antibiotic resistance with school buses. We have all kinds of systems. Um, so that being said, that's just part of what I do. The other part is my research, which I took my love of science communication and my love of GIS and I became a geospatial ecologist. And what that does and what that means is that I study how people and nature are related across time and space. So I did that in the Cook Islands. I did an interactive map of uh, reef health and how that related to the people that live there and how they use the reef. And now in my dissertation, I am studying uh, how we use science communication by the Y'all know the CPRA, Coastal Restoration Protection Authority? Have y'all talked about that? Some do, some don't. Okay. Um, so, actually, somebody wants to hold my mouth. I'll talk about it. And then we'll talk more. Okay. So, basically, um, so how much do y'all know about what the coastal restoration and land loss and stuff like that that's happening in Louisiana? A decent amount? Yeah. Let me give me a topic that you don't know. Oh, that'd be about them. Okay. Do you know about how they're planning to fix that with coastal restoration? Diversion. Yeah. The sediment diversion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So there's two ways that we are protecting, two main ways that they're trying to protect Louisiana. The first is freshwater diversion and the second is sediment diversion. Does anybody know the difference between those? So is it sediment diversion out of the Mississippi River mm -hmm. and freshwater? Yeah, no, you're good. Okay, so basically they're almost the exact same thing, except so a diversion is basically you cut into the river, you just jam some concrete in the ground, almost like you cut the levee basically, and you open it and you have a gate that blocks it. And all the differences between a freshwater diversion and a sediment diversion is where you cut basically how high you're cutting. So in a freshwater diversion, you want to cut into the river only where freshwater comes through, no sediment. Because sediment mm -hmm. brings turbidity, which can smother all of our commercial fisheries, like oysters and crawfish. 
With a sediment diversion, you cut lower, so you don't want the fresh water to come through, you just want the sediment to come through, and that way you build land. That is the thought. So literally it's the exact same process, it's just where you cut within the river. Um, so, yes, the sediment diversion, so right now, we actually, a month ago, got the budget approved to run the sediment diversion into this bay called Barataria Bay. We're up here at Barataria Bay. Okay, so the sediment diversion is going right here. We also have
the ability for us to move and get the food out of there, so there's so many people that live and rely on Sicily Louisiana that are not even doing this. So there's actually the first 20 migrators, federally funded climate change migrators, are on the search for Delta. They're called the Al Jazeera and Charles, they're a Native American community, and they have received, under the Obama administration, $74 million to move, to be climate uh, migrated. They have not yet received that money. That was over 10 years ago. So they are still there. Um, and what they are seeing is that literally their homes are underwater. Mm -hmm. um, they can't live there anymore. The community is down to like 50 people. It was about 600. And they just can't afford to leave because you have this issue. And this is where the political side of it comes in or the sociological side of it is that people that live in coastal Louisiana make less than $20,000 a year. And then we have flood insurance rates. Louisiana has like the highest flood insurance rate ever. So even if your home is in a flood zone, I don't know if any of you guys own homes or know about flood insurance, um, but basically if your home is in a flood zone, you are required to buy flood insurance. And in in my house, and I don't even live in a flood zone, my flood insurance for me to get it is $1,200 a year. And I don't live in a flood zone. The people that live in coastal Louisiana that do live in a flood zone are up to like seven, dollars $8,000 a year. Like on some, for some of them, that's half of their yearly pay. Um, so they can't afford to leave because nobody's going to buy their house because nobody wants to buy a house that they grand just to flood insurance for. So they can't leave. Nobody's paying for them to leave. Nobody's helping them leave. They can't raise their house because companies want to charge them $100,000 to raise it. And so you basically have this sitting duck that CPRA is like, hey, I'm going to fix all your problems by pummeling sediment into your backyard. And it's going to be fine. You're not going to flood. Don't worry about it. All your stuff's going to be cool. Your fisheries are not going to be impacted. We're going to have all this money, and it's going to be fantastic. And the problem is that when you take, when you have people that make so little money that they really can't advocate for themselves in these situations because they don't have the political pool, pull like people in the government do, then they're left the people like me and other graduate students and other scientists that are pushing to be their advocates and be the ones that say, hey, no, it's, you can't just funnel sediment into somebody's backyard and claim that it's for the betterment of the, the whole state because we're going to provide, it's going to bring all this money, we're going to save the coast, without taking into consideration the fact that these people live there. And so that is kind of the main way that you're literally seeing people's homes get completely taken out from underneath them. Mm -hmm. And the PRA is just like, oh my God. Um, so in your survey work, geographically, where are you uh, doing that work? Along the coastal Louisiana in general, is it in a certain parish, or is it in Yeah, so um, the cool part about, so Louisiana has what we call a jurisdictional coastal zone. Um, and they recently, within the last like five years, increased uh, the northern extent of that coastal zone. So almost a third of our state is officially in the coastal zone. We are, we are currently in so my survey, so part of my dissertation, I did um, a large spatial analysis. So I predicted how many ecosystem services we're going to lose over the next 50 years, um, acre by acre, in the coastal zone, um, and calculated that total sum amount. So basically, if we implement the master plan the way that we plan, uh, what our annual ecosystem service provisioning for the entire state is going to be, and then if we don't, how much more we're going to lose. Um, and then. Uh, the other part that I did is that I surveyed, um, we did 620 coastal residents. Um, and so the cool part about surveys is that you just kind of send them out and hope that people answer them to the best <laughs> of their knowledge. Um, and if you want to pay more money, you can tell them where to get them from. So I did all of the zip codes located in the coastal zone. Um, so there's, there are, there's going to be more people like when you have a higher population density, more likely you're going to have more survey respondents in that area. Uh, but yeah, so right now it's the jurisdictional region, the coastal zone. And part of that survey was to determine what's the best way and what what makes people value their relationship with nature. Mm -hmm. So is it the fact that their community economically depends on nature? Do they like to be outside all the time? Do they have important family memories there? what are the factors that we as researchers can use to better communicate what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so, actually a result that I found yesterday is that um, who people think are in their community is actually a stronger influence on uh, 
how they value money. So it's not how much money they get out of uh, the out of the wetlands in Louisiana. It's not the fact that the state needs it. It's not the fact that um, our economy depends on it. It's the fact that it's who they are, where they live, and who they live with and around and can interact with, and how all of that contributes to how they value. So. Are you seeing differences, and that's great that you're finding that, um, are you seeing differences with, with ecosystem services that people understand compared to ones that they don't understand? So like carbon sequestration, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people might hear that and be like, I don't know what that means, put a dollar value on it, mm -hmm. because I don't understand it compared to like a fisheries or storm protection or pollination where they, they do understand. Yeah, so the, so there are some, I haven't analyzed them entirely yet, so there are some questions that I put in the survey that compared, I gave them the dollar value of the service, so basically said it's worth $10 per acre for carbon sequestration, or I told them, uh, hey, the take, they take carbon out of the atmosphere, lowers our CO2, and that is something that the wetlands provide us. And I got them to say which one they liked more. Um, and my initial, and I did that for all of the services pretty much that we include. And my initial looking over the data uh, is saying that it's not the dollar value one. It's literally the fact that it's the concept of what they provide us, not how much money it actually is. Which is interesting because it means that the dollar value thought of like economy of blue all doesn't necessarily bank well for social restoration. It's very much like the way that you communicate science nowadays, especially like in general for restoration, is you have to take into consideration how people use nature and how they see themselves within nature. Um, and I think that's important for all of you and all of us as researchers to think about when we're doing our research, even if it's not on science communication, if it's not on how we relate to, to nature, something as researchers that we have to think about is how we're talking about what we're doing. Because um, at the end of the day, when you guys graduate and you guys find a job, what's going to help <laughs> you with all of it is being able to talk about what you do and being able to effectively tell people that what you're doing is important. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. So are there other mismatches or conflicts between kind of what, the, what local people value and what the, the near term changes to those ecosystems? Like when they get when that sediment gets starts being deposited in their backyard, is there a are there any mismatches between what they want and you know maybe a broader benefit to that to Louisiana for that sediment, but is it really benefiting? Yeah, I think, um, so I have a whole section of my survey that's specifically targeting, like, people's reactions to the sediment diversion, um, and I just haven't looked at it yet, I just don't know. um, but the, I think the main thing is that there have been, there actually have been papers that have published about, like, um, especially fishermen, the fishermen community in Louisiana is so strong, uh, because they all live in coastal Louisiana, you change. I mean, if you, if you fuck with process season in Louisiana, you are seriously <laughs> going to get in trouble. Um, and that's what those kind of are going to do. So they're messing with the process, they're messing with oysters, um, and all these people, so I don't know, um, so we have oyster leases in Louisiana. So basically all the state bottom water, uh, basically in the bracket part of Louisiana, is bought out by the You can buy a piece of it, the bottom water, and make it can go on your own little um, and you can harvest your own oysters and make your own money. And so what's happening is that those sediment diversions are going straight over these people's oyster reefs. And oyster fishermen are mad because they're like, hey, this is my private property and I bought this lease and you guys are taking your decisions and funneling them into my private property. And so yeah, it's a whole... I think at the end of the day, we have been fighting about sediment diversion since the first master plan came out in 2012, and CPRA has continued to push forward. So the sediment diversions are happening, it's just trying to figure out how best to make sure that the people that live there get the help that they need to make it. It's also, just to be clear though, right, it's going to change this to Lindy, yeah. the oysters are going to move. So it's not, there won't be no oysters anymore. 
but that individual who might have a lot of money and a lot of political pull, that individual's parcel might not have oysters on it. But it's often sold as you're going to destroy oysters. It's actually going to destroy oysters for that person or that community, but not necessarily oyster recruitment overall. So you're saying the diversion, sediment diversion, is made to build land. Yeah. And now I guess it's seen as a global good. Yeah. But but local fishermen, oystermen, uh, oh wait, fishers. Yeah, fisher oystermen. Yeah. Okay. They have interests. They conflict <laughs> with the greater good. And the, the other weird thing about the sediment diversions is that when you actually look at how much land area that they plan to build, it's minuscule. So like when I did my spatial analysis, I found that still, even with the master plan, we lose a third of the land in coastal Louisiana, and we're going to lose a third of the ecosystem services that we have currently, which means those oysters, um, like the recruitment's going to shift, but we don't know how the economy is even going to be benefited by these sediment diversions because the location of where they're putting them is already the more salt water and the barrier islands that are diminishing all of that is just going to increase the tidal energy and the wave energy into those bays barataria and uh Terrebonne and breton and all of it is just there's no way for us to accurately predict the effectiveness of the sediment diversions and i think that is one of the main things that fishermen are so upset about. So that you can't, they can't adequately say, hey, we know for a fact that your one, your property's gonna be cool. One, two, you're gonna have pictures. Three, um, our economy's gonna be benefited. And four, the land is actually gonna sit there. Because they're funneling mud, mud, and hoping that it sticks. Um, the mud has, mud is very, very small. Um, so it takes a very little amount of waves to make it. Other questions? How about other questions about just uh, uh, things uh, that were valuable about our program that you guys might be interested in? That, that, or maybe I'll ask. So, Vanessa, what were some of the specific things that, that you experienced or, or learned about or, or whatever while an ESRM student that have benefited you in grad school? Um, I can honestly tell you. Um, I deal with, for the job that I run, the Environment Source Program, I deal with over 30 graduate students and undergraduate students every single week. I knew more as it's coming out of my bachelor's degree with ESRM than many of the PhD students that are in our program. Now. What? Um, what? Say that again. Say that again. I love it. I, 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 this music to my ear. Say it again. I knew more from our ESRM degree than most PhD students do. What? <laughs> You should clap for us. Why aren't you guys clapping for us? That's great. Great. Uh, I did not plant that. I did not ask her to say that. Are you uh, uh, so what I will say is um, this program has pretty much built who I was as a scientist. Um, built who I was as a scientist. I built my, I had no idea. I knew I have a mom that has a PhD in oceanography. I have a dad that has a PhD in oceanography. I told myself I was not going to have a PhD in oceanography. I was going to be completely different from them. I'm not going to say the thing. <laughs> um, and my uh, job and my experience in the especially going to the Cook Islands, so doing that, uh, made me go back to being a marine scientist. So I was not planning. I was. I had. I had certification to be a game ranger in South Africa. I was working in Iraq. I spent the summer studying lions and cheetahs in South Africa. I was doing my bachelor's degree, and that's what I was going to do. And then we went to the Cook Islands, and I was like, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, we're going to forget all that. <laughs> no, we're in Earth. You're welcome. I'm sorry. You were doing yeah. Earth emphasis? I did. Oh, it, was different. it was different. We had different emphasis. Oh, uh, yeah. I did resource management. I did the one that you didn't have to take Oak into. That was one. Yes, <laughs> um, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you use calculus and physics? <laughs> um, I have used chemistry. I have used chemistry. Um, I do not use calculus. Mm. I actually, because I'm petty, I proved so a prerequisite of our PhD program was to take Calc 2. You had to have Calc 2. And the reason was because you had to pass physical oceanography, which is all these annoying equations. And I said, mm -mm, not going to happen. So I proved to them, and I passed all of the classes for our PhD program without taking Calc 2. Mm. It was the last class that I took. Um, so yeah. 